Hello and welcome to this talk. You can see the title, YouTube probably won't make you rich, but I think you should try it anyway. Here's the game plan for the talk. I'm gonna discuss my history on YouTube. I've uploaded videos to the platform for over a decade. Uh, then we'll talk about the economics, the very challenging economics of making money on YouTube. And despite those challenging economics, I'm gonna make an argument for why I think many people watching this video should consider uploading videos anyway. So let's begin with my history on YouTube. And it actually doesn't begin on YouTube at all. It begins with a TED Talk. I was watching this TED Talk by this guy called Sal Khan. And if you don't know who Khan is, he should be a very famous person. He founded the best educational website on the internet. It's called Khan Academy. If you have a student between ages K to 12, even first or second year university, odds are they have seen a Khan Academy video. And I've got to tell you, they are fantastic. So anyway, I was watching Khan's talk and he was explaining how ed, uh, video could be useful in education. And as I watched, I thought, well, I'm a college professor. And it was like he was speaking to me. I, was, I just thought this absolutely will work for me. So I immediately, after I watched the talk, I was inspired and I said, I'm going to use his videos in my class. So I searched up on Khan Academy for accounting videos and there were like two and they were more aimed at an undergrad audience or uh, a high school audience, not even an undergrad audience. And they certainly wouldn't have suited my students very well. And so I searched around the internet, looking for good videos, trying to kind of follow the Khan Academy playbook. And I just didn't find anything out there. And so I thought, well, if I can't find it out there, maybe I'll have to make them myself. And so I did. And what I'm about to show you is hard for me to watch, you know, a decade later. This is my very first video I ever uploaded to YouTube. So hold your noses, everybody. Here we go. In this series of videos, we're going to talk about preparing and understanding the financial statements. We're going to learn how to prepare an income statement, a statement of retained earnings, and a balance sheet. But be okay, I'm not going to make you watch the whole thing, uh, just to give you a flavor for what I was up to. And immediately after uploading this and sharing it with the students in my class, I got a very positive reaction. And it's unusual to get such a universal positive reaction from students. Some students will say something's too fast. Others will say it's too slow. Some will say too hard. Others will say too easy. This was universally beloved in my classes. And so I thought, well, this is, I'm getting a clear signal here. I got to do this more. And so over the years, I've continued to upload videos to support my classes. And here's just a short snippet of the videos over the years. In this series of videos, we're going to talk about inventory. In this series of videos, we're going to talk about relevant costs for decision making. In this series of videos, we're going to talk about job order costing. In this video, we're going to talk about costs. All right, welcome to chapter seven of our exploration of this book, Auditing by Aaron's. In this group of videos, we're going to learn all about the financial statements. In this group of videos, we are going to talk about transfer pricing. Welcome to module 10 of our financial accounting course. This module, fairly technical module on shareholders equity. Okay, so having gone through that over the years, I received this comment a couple of years ago and it hit me pretty hard and it certainly laid bare there. So crazy to watch your appearance and quality of video change from 2012 to 2017. Well, it's actually 2011 and now I'm done up to 2020. I've added videos and it is true. I, I've, I've uploaded videos to the platform for over a decade and it wasn't until I kind of looked at like my picture over the years that I realized this has consumed a significant part of my life and I've enjoyed it and it's been challenging, but I think it's been worth it. Uh, so in the next section, we're going to discuss the economics of uploading videos to YouTube. How can we help? Okay. I have a, I have a question for you, Christy. So I'm a mom and a hairstylist, and I just want you, uh, I want to ask you how high is the probability of me becoming maybe like a YouTube star or an Instagram 
start uh, making my own YouTube channel with hairstyling. That video clip was from the Dave Ramsey show. It's a great show. It's a guy giving financial advice, helping people get out of debt. And they, that woman was obviously asking career advice. And it's not unusual. People are interested in becoming a YouTube star and an Instagram star. I saw this article on CNBC the other day. Kids now dream of being professional YouTubers rather than astronaut study finds. And you can see the top of the list there, ahead of teacher, athlete, musician, and astronaut, YouTuber. Uh, so people are interested in doing this as a career or making money on this platform. And unfortunately, this section of the talk, as the title suggested, uh, it's hard and you don't make a lot of money on the platform. So I'm going to give you some of my own numbers. You might be curious. Um, my channel over the years has gotten 6 million views and I'm very proud. 6 million is a lot of views for an educational YouTuber talking about accounting in a fairly dry way, like let's do an accounting problem and discuss a balance sheet, right? It's not like uh, some video that's likely to go viral or something like this. Uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased with those numbers. 6.3 million views, 41,000 subscribers. Uh, I would certainly consider that doing well as far as uh, uh, an educational YouTube channel goes. Now, here are, is, is the problem. I, I would think that that might make money. And I, I remember very early on, uh, my dad and I would email back and forth about how the channel was doing and just discuss YouTube in general. And this was a quote from him. And it was very naive at the time. Uh, certainly looking back, it seemed very naive. He said, Tony, if you could get $1 per view, you'd be on to something. Well, YouTube doesn't pay $1 per view, unfortunately. Uh, these are the numbers for me. Now, the numbers will be different for every channel. The way it works is they auction off uh, uh, rights for advertisers to put an ad in front of your audience. So if your audience is wealthy and Swiss, uh, you will make more money than uh, if your audience is not as wealthy or older or whatever demographics the advertisers are after. So for my channel, which actually uh, does well as far as they call it CPM, which is the amount advertisers are willing to pay. My channel does pretty well because again, I have college students aged 18 to 30. Uh, most of them are American. You know, it's a good audience and, and my videos aren't controversial, right? I'm not yelling about Donald Trump or Trudeau or something like this. I'm just doing a how to helpful video. So all of these things are things advertisers like. And so this is my, my CPM data for me, a million views gets me 3000 Canadian dollar. So not a dollar per view for per view not even a penny for per view it takes about three views for me to get one penny uh, and so you sort of do the rough math for yourself if you're starting a new channel and trying to upload videos uh, you need in the millions and millions of views a year I, I guess a minimum wage job in Canada now is around fifteen dollars an hour that's around thirty thousand dollars a year that converts to 10 million views at my CPM rate so you need a channel that's much you know my total views over the 10 years is six thousand so six million views you'd need a view uh, channel that would be very productive probably ten times Times larger than my channel to make a real living doing this. And so just as you're thinking about this, I would say if I were a parent of a kid and they were thinking they want to do it as a career, I would say, okay, you can try, but you know, you need a hundred thousand subscribers and 10 million views a year before you can even start thinking you're going to be making a living on YouTube. Um, you don't even start getting any money from YouTube until you're over a thousand subscribers. There's a few other metrics you have to hit, but if you're over a thousand subscribers, you'll hit them. And again, when you're over a thousand subscribers and you're getting maybe, you know, 50,000 views a month, you're making pennies, right? Like it, when monetization turns on on YouTube, you're not making a lot of money. So for me, it took 18 months for me to hit a thousand subscribers and I wasn't doing this as a full-time job, but I was regularly working on this stuff. Uh, so, you know, as you're sort of planting this seed for you and thinking, oh, maybe I want to make money on YouTube or maybe I want to do this. This is the long game. You are not going to start making money right away. Even the most explosive successful channels, it's at least a few months before uh, you could expect any YouTube cash flows to appear. But despite this, despite these challenging economic headwinds, I do think 
you ought to try it anyway. And part three, I'm going to discuss why. So I can't make an economic case for uploading videos to YouTube because I really don't think you're going to get rich. Even if you find some traction on YouTube, I don't think the money is good enough. Why then do I think people should upload videos to YouTube? And the first is the simplest. Listen, if you came in thinking, I'd like to share something, well, this gives you an, a platform to share what you love, right? Share things that you're interested in. I am an avid disc golfer. I love disc golf. And we have a, many wonderful disc golf courses here in Kamloops. And one of them is on MacArthur Island. And on the 16th hole, there are always people out and I want to throw my disc and there's people taking pictures of this tree every day, thousands of dollars of camera equipment uh, sitting there underneath this tree shooting up. And what are these people doing? Well, there is a mother owl has given birth to two or three, I think, uh, beautiful little owlets. And uh, everybody wants a picture of these photogenic little owlets. Now, none of these people are misleading themselves into thinking, I'm going to get my picture in National Geographic. I'm going to make money from this hobby. They're doing it because it's fun. And Honestly, sharing something you love is fun. And so if you've watched YouTube videos and you think, yeah, I, I think that might be fun to do, I'm living proof it is fun, right? I, I think it's fun to do accounting videos. I'm sure whatever hobby you have, you could find a way to make sharing it fun. So that's the first reason. The second reason, I actually think of my niece. My niece has actually gotten quite into YouTube. She does these little comedy vlogs, not little, they're great, uh, great comedy vlogs um, and skits and things. And she uploads them to YouTube. And my, my sister was a little concerned, you know, it's a social network and you're uploading stuff. And my niece is, I think, 11 years old. Um, and I, I only see the positive here. And I'll talk about the, the challenges with kids and social media, but the positive is you learn a new skill. Like she is an excellent video editor and it's just a superpower, right? She takes a job from a local restaurant and the local restaurant needs help. You know, she's a server there and they need help with their social media. She's a pro. She knows how to edit videos like unbelievably much better than I do already. And she's 11. It is a skill that you are learning with this coronavirus. The fact that I've learned this skill, I know how to make videos for the internet. Now all of my colleagues are reaching out to me. I get a lot of emails every day saying, Hey, can you help us, you know, wrap our heads around uploading videos for this platform or for, for this context that we're living in. So it is a useful skill and you never know when it's going to come in handy in your life. Um, just quickly on kids and social media, I, I do think that as a parent, you have an 11 year old or however old your kid is, I think you should monitor what they upload to YouTube. I think it's worth double checking and making sure it's consistent with your family's values. Um, I will say, you know, I've, I've looked at TikTok and Snapchat and Facebook and Instagram of all of them. I think YouTube is like the safest one, right? The kid does some creation and puts it out into the world and that's it. It's it's less creepy to me than Snapchat or even TikTok uh, worries me more uh, when I see what goes on there. So uh, YouTube would be the least risky of the bunch, but I still think there needs to be parental involvement in any social media. And I'm certainly not advocating you just set kids loose on social media. I think there's significant risks to all of that. I'm not an expert in that area, but I just have a seven-year-old daughter who's fascinated by TikTok. So uh, there we are. Um, Another thing I had worried about, and I worried about this deeply, was commenters. I thought people are going to be nasty. It's the internet. I've been on message boards. People are just mean to each other. And my commenters tend to be nice. And why are they nice? Well, because I'm doing a how-to helpful video. I imagine if I uploaded videos on why Trudeau is an idiot or why Trudeau is the greatest guy in the world, I would get nasty comments. But the fact is people are just interested in learning something when they come to my videos. And I've provided something useful to them. So here's just a quick snippet. I just Googled Tony Bell YouTube. And if I click on the first hit here, I'll just go through like top three comments. 
Uh, I just passed management accounting. Uh, th- excellent work. Rip headphone ears. I guess I did something loud there. Thank you for this one. Tony, I want to say a big thank you. Thanks, Tony. Everybody's just being nice to me, right? It's, uh, uh, it's not critical. It's not negative. It's a, just a positive love fest. And I, I think if you put something positive out there into the world, you'd be surprised. You will get positive love back. But I do want to show you the nastiest, meanest comment I have ever received. I get embarrassed when I think about it. Here it is. The meanest comment I've ever received. This person says, stupidest video I've ever seen. I thought, I'm a nice guy. I'm going to kill this guy with kindness. Um, you know, I'm, I'm representing myself. I'm kind of representing my university. I want to send positivity, positive vibes out there in the world. So I say, stupidest ever have you ever seen the one where the monkey smells its finger then falls over seriously search monkey smells finger falls over by the way you should search that it's a funny video it's really stupid so i thought okay i'm being kind of funny i'm being nice and killing him with kindness and uh well he got the best of me sounds better than this <laughs> i think i think i got ruined by that i think he definitely won that war uh, of the minds but Anyway, if that's the meanest, and that is honestly the meanest comment I've ever gotten, um, it's not so bad. Um, The final thing uh, is, it's fun. I I hope I'm expressing that. It's hard to sort of express this through the video, but I I was going through some old emails as I was getting ready to to make this and just doing research on, on my history on the platform, and something uh, but between my dad, we kind of bonded over this. He would send me an email every day with an update on how many views I had th- from the previous day. And so here's just a, a, a quick snippet. So he emails me on April 4th and he says 4587. He emails me on April 5th, says 4660. And I say, if I can do 60 per day, that's excellent. I remember our back and forth. It was There was giddiness over like, oh, there's 20 views yesterday. I wonder what happened. Oh, there's 30 views. It was so exciting just to feel like, hey, this has gained some traction. Some people are liking what I'm doing. They're smelling what I'm cooking to use the rocks phrase. Uh, They're enjoying what I'm putting out there into the world. And if you manage to sort of capture, and again, you've seen my channel isn't humongous, but if you even capture a little feel for that, it is addictive and it is a wonderful feeling. So uh, uh, that's another reason you might want to make these videos. So It's a a, a great thing, and I do highly recommend you do it. Now, you might have watched this, and we're coming to the end now. Uh, You might have watched this and said, okay, it's fine for him and not for me. Well, if so, this next part isn't really for you. But if you thought, "Ah, you know what, I'm interested in this. It seems like a fun thing to do, and I I think it is. Um, I want you to think about what you will make. Now, for me... When I think about YouTube videos, I think about making something useful, right? Something somebody wants to know something and they they go to me to to learn how to do some accounting thing. But even I'm thinking about doing this as a hobbyist. Here are the things I'm thinking of doing. I want to go on many of the hikes of hikecamoops.ca, a great website, and I want to vlog them just to show the experience of going on the hike. Uh, I also want to do every ski run at Sun Peaks and do a point of view of the descent and sort of maybe talk over it and explain what it looks like. And finally, I mentioned I'm a disc golf fan. I'd like to disc golf, uh, kind of map every hole in Kamloops and do sort of a, a video kind of, you know, how they fly over a golf hole. I'd like to do that for all of our disc golf holes in Kamloops. So those are all things I'm thinking of, and they all kind of fit this definition of it would be useful to somebody, <laughs> maybe not to you, but to somebody. So uh, when I leave you, or as you're leaving this, I want you to think, what will you make? Will it be something useful, something funny, something beautiful, or something else? And uh, the final question is, well, whatever you make, I hope you'll share it with me. And by the way, if you're thinking of my disc golf idea, if you're thinking of stealing it, I'm one step ahead of you. 
hole five at Rose Hill might be my favorite hole on the course. And maybe it's because it's one of the few holes that I can challenge for birdie. It only takes 250 from the blues, 180 from the reds. From the blues, if you miss short or left, you are in bogey trouble. But that's not the reason I love the hole. I think you're able to see it. It has one of the best views of Kamloops you're ever going to see. So whether you're birdieing or bogeying, I hope you'll enjoy the view. Okay, you've made it to the very end of the video. I'm amazed that anybody's here. If you are here, thank you for being here. Thanks for watching the video. And if you're here for the premiere, I am hanging out in the chat. So if you have any questions or comments you'd like me to read, please uh, enter them into the chat. I'll be happy to answer any questions or respond to any comments. Thanks again for watching and have a great day. Bye for now.